I'm going to spend some time talking to you a little bit about what we know about how the brain develops uh, through childhood and adolescence. There are two p particular areas, the early stages of life and adolescence when it's very vulnerable, okay, because it's going through some interesting changes. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, I like putting this up there because people go, what's that? I would talk about notions of differences, potential difference between males and females. All right. And then I'm going to spend a little time just talking about some of the things we know are impacting upon the human brain in ways that we are only beginning to understand, um, not least of which is technology. Right? It's, it's vastly changing. Uh, by the way, most of the notes that you're going to see here, the things you're going to see here, I'll make available to you. So I'll get it to Nicola and she can send it off to you. All right. So I want to start by dispelling a few myths. This is important. Myth number one, we only use about 10% of our brain. No, that's true. We use most of our brain all the time. Okay, so when you see movies, not long ago it was a movie, um, it's called Lucy, I think, with Scarlett Johansson. I don't know if you saw the movie, it's a really bad movie, uh, but from my perspective, any movie with Scarlett Johansson is worth watching. Um, <laughs> but in that movie, she goes through a series of things where her brain improves. It doesn't work that way. We use most of our brain all the time. Uh, playing Mozart to a child before birth will improve their math scores. It doesn't work that way, you know. And what we do know about, that's interesting about music, because you probably have a lot of kids around you, they like to listen to music when they're studying, um, and that's not uncommon, but it really depends on the kind of music they're listening to. You see, if they're listening to things like, I'm gonna sacrifice my sister, um, or hip hop, which some people like to listen to, but it's, apparently it's like music, but with profoundly stupid lyrics. If you're listening to that, what that makes you want to do is be active, doesn't it? I mean, this is why music is so powerful in movies. You remember seeing Rocky for the first time? And how many of you wanted to run upstairs and eat raw eggs? Right? What we do know is that if you're listening to that kind of music, it makes you feel invigorated. Hip hop kind of music, pop music, kids listen to. If you want to enhance your concentration and attention, classical music is best. It doesn't make you smarter, but it enhances your attention. Um, I know, now, that's a hard sell to 15 year olds, no question but we do know it improves attention. Some people are more right brain and others are more left brain. This is false, patently false. You're not more right brain or more left brain. We do know that particular things are, some things are specialized in different regions of the brain. Uh, for example, most of what you do in terms of language is housed in the left hemisphere, um, but in terms of putting intonation things together for speech, that's in the right hemisphere. So you're not more right brain or more left brain, nor do you have a particular learning modality. You're not a visual learner, an auditory learner, a kinesthetic learner. And, and some of you are looking at, might be looking at, thinking, who invited this guy? He's wrong. Look, you can look at any evidence you like. I can tell you right now, there isn't any empirical evidence that suggests you are a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner. Um, none whatsoever. And so if you buy into that and you try to ascribe that to students, you're wasting a monumental amount of your time. What we do know in an educational context that's most important in terms of learning is determining what's the most m best modality for the content. Right, what's the best modality for the content? And some of you might like Howard Gardner's work in multiple intelligences. I do, I do, but it, those aren't learning styles. And the other thing that's the best thing about Gardner's work, I suppose, is that what it asks you to do is think about how many different ways can you deliver content, thereby you might engage with intrinsic motivation on a different level, okay? Again, you don't have to believe anything I say. We now have that verb in the human language. You can go Google it, and I advise you to Google the myth of learning styles and find the evidence that tells us this. We can boost brain power with brain-friendly toys and early enrichment programs. No, we can't. Not long ago in this country, there was an infomercial, a little guy in a high chair, mom's holding a flashcard that says elbow, he's all of about two years old, and the narrative in the back says brain science tells us we can teach a two-year-old to read. No, it doesn't. See, mom's holding this card and he's going, oh, bo. In all likelihood, what was probably happening leading up to that, when mom and dad had the flashcard and they're going, elbow, 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 uh, and his survival instincts are thinking, oh, would they just please be quiet? <laughs> elbow. There isn't a shred of evidence to support some of those programs. In fact, the company that perpetuated that myth had to pay every single penny back that they, has, that they brought in for the product to the amount of $175 million, okay? There isn't any evidence, and we're gonna talk about enrichment in a minute. The brain can objectively record most aspects of reality. A lot of people think the human brain's kind of like a, a I'm a bit old school, a video recorder. We do things different now, a digital recorder. We localize it, we put a particular region of our brain. It doesn't work that way. Our, our memories are very illusionary and we add to them. We have different types of memories. The one that we rely on the most, that we think is the most powerful, we can draw on pretty are our episodic memories, the episodes of our life. And very powerful. 
However, some of you like to go fishing. Would that be a fair comment? And you might catch a fish. And then a week later, you're telling your friends about this fish you caught. And then the week after that, you're talking to your friends about this massive thing you pulled in a boat, took you about an hour. In reality, if you look at the picture, it's a white thing, it's about this big. We add things to our memories all the time. This is why eyewitness testimony is so problematic and has to be corroborated with so many things, because we add things to our memories. Sitting in chairs for extended periods of time supports optimal student learning. <laughs> School kids today and adults alike have become more sedentary than any other generation. You know, movement is the only thing that you do that basically lights up all regions of your brain simultaneously. Your um, cerebellum houses 50% of your neurons, sits at the back of your brain. It works monumentally every time you're moving. Okay? It also does many other things. Right? Sitting is not a good thing, and we do too much of it. Exposing an infant or toddler to language DVDs will boost their vocabulary. No. What do we do if we want to enhance kids' vocabulary in the early stages of life? Read. Now, where are my early childhood people? Put your hands up nice and high, because inevitably one of you is going to say this. Go. Oh. What? 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 Where was it? I knew. Usually, to, when they're on key, I'll get about four or five of them simultaneously go, sing to them. Talk, sing, what else? Read and? This is one thing that's really important. Pardon? Play. One thing beyond that. How you respond is incredibly important. Andrew Meltzoff at the University of Washington found that they can extend kids' vocabulary purely by over-exaggerating their response. Right, and some of you have done this, I'm sure. I remember my daughter, first time she uttered these words, duh. She said, Dad, she said, Dad. She didn't say, Mom, she said, Dad. Say it again, <laughs> say it again, say it again. Um, and in fact, what Meltzoff did with some of his colleagues, they over-exaggerated responses to infant children and found quickly that these kids were trying to say more as soon as possible because it's intrinsically rewarding, right? Kids' eyes light up like, oh, look at the reaction I got, duh. Um, every drink does not kill 10,000 cells. I usually put this up for conferences because usually at a conference people are thinking not about the conference itself but what's happening after the conference. <laughs> However, we do know that in the, in the early stages of life it can be really problematic, but also during adolescent years. I'm going to talk about alcohol, the impact of alcohol in the adolescent brain shortly. Uh, not only alcohol, but any, uh, anything that kids take in. Uh, because if you, you have to remember that why about when puberty kicks in, the brain starts to restructure itself, so it's very vulnerable to any sort of environmental toxicity. So we're going to talk about that. All right, so this is Neuroscience 101. You ready for a bit of neuroscience? Here we go. This is the best part of my day. Your leadership team did this before. They're going to think that they don't have to do it, but you do. I'd like you to put up one of your hands just like this, please. I want you to imagine this is a neuron. When you're born, you're born with about 500 billion of these things. This thing's called an axon. If you had things coming out of your elbows, which would be unfortunate, those are axon terminals. Your fingers would represent dendrites. One human neuron can have as many as 10,000 dendrites. You have five. Wiggle your dendrites. Now put up another neuron. Wiggle your dendrites. Now this is the best part of my day and why I love doing this. Every person say, do this. Oh, you could stop at any time. I'm just having a good time looking at it. And some of you were struggling a little bit. You're kind of going like that. It was like an air traffic controller. Um, what you're actually doing is mimicking what the human brain does about 17 days after conception. The neural tube closes. The brain starts to form. Neurons generate. They migrate. They speak to each other. They speak to each other through an electrochemical impulse called a synapse. I think you've heard that word before. It is messages from the dendrites of one neuron to the axon terminals of another. The more powerful the stimulation, the more repetitive it is, then you have this. And the brain hardwires for certain things. Okay? The brain expects some stimulation and depends on others, and I'm going to differentiate for those for you in a minute. Uh, for teachers in here, <laughs> there's a great study that came out. Some of you might be feeling this way now when you're at staff meetings and stuff after school when you really want to be there, and you're like, oh, I'm so tired. I read this study. This might work for you. If you're feeling a bit sluggish as this afternoon goes on, and you just take it, you feel kind of tension waning, you take your hand, you do this, you can reinvigorate the frontal lobe connections <laughs> in your brain. Now, I think that has great classroom applications too. <laughs> Trevor, come here. And you can tell Trevor's parents, I'm not hitting Trevor, we're just reinvigorating the frontal lobes of his connection. If you want to find the study, I'll send it to you. 
So we know that experience is really important. By the way, when you look at these diagrams, uh, always remember they're a bit misleading because they're two-dimensional. No two human neurons in the brain physically touch. It's all through an electrochemical impulse. Oh, by the way, do you know when the human brain fully matures, out of curiosity? Not a rhetorical question. Yell something out. Roughly. We know that most of the hard work in terms of um, fine-tuning happens between about 12 years of age and 19, and then the rest of it takes place in females, finishes about 24. For males, a few years ago, research thought it was about 28. Some new research says maybe 30. Some of you are probably thinking, no, it's a little bit longer than that. So here's a very important message for you, those of you with husbands, partners, boyfriends. While it takes longer for our brains to mature, they actually have a tendency to deteriorate faster. So your opportunity to truly experience who we are is limited. <laughs> so you need to make sure you worship each and every day. Right? Which means when he arrives home, it might be nice to have a cool, refreshing beverage ready for him. Just a thought. When you see diagrams, it's a little bit misleading. Um, by the time a child is three years of age, he'll have, he or she will have more neural connections to their brain than their pediatrician. The brain actually overcompensates. And then it's busy during the teenage years getting rid of some of those connections. We're going to talk about that. So this is the kind of things you see in terms of synaptic density at birth, at six years of age, and at 14 years of age, where it goes through a whole restructuring. At one year of age, a child's brain's neural activity is more similar to a 28-year-old adult than it is to its five-day-old sibling. The first year or so of life and beyond, probably from about 17 days after conception to roughly three years of life, the brain is very, very, very busy constructing itself. And it does, through, so, through, so, sorry, it does so through stimulation. So here's what we know that's really important. We know in the first few years of life, I'll put all these up. I'm going a bit fast, but I don't like to read everything on the slides because that would make it PowerPointless. But what we know is this. The first few years of life for a child in the environment then will have an impact on their behavior, health, and learning long term. Um, in a real context, uh, putting kids in any kind of refugee camps or detention centers means that while they're three or four years of age and they're in these places that are high stress and unpredictable, they're going to present massive mental health problems as adolescents and adults. Okay? That's highly problematic. So stimulation is important. There are two types. Experience expectant stimulation, experience dependent stimulation. Put in other terms, nature and nurture. See, the brain expects certain things to happen and it depends on others. That what it depends on are the learning experiences that a child has as they grow up and as you have as an adult. Well, I'll break that down for you in a minute. Just to show you how important or powerful stimulation is, anyone ever been to London? If, you, if you've never had, well, if you have, you would realize that that's Photoshop because the drivers there aren't that genuinely happy. <laughs> if you haven't, you should. It's an interesting place. But are you aware that drivers there, they have to go through a series of exams called the knowledge. Yeah, some of you are aware of the knowledge. It's, you think NAPLAN is difficult? This thing is arduous. It takes years. Some people never get through it. But you have to pass this before you can get a license to drive in this cab. What researchers were wondering, they thundered, would that have an impact? Could that actually have some kind of impact on aspects of their brain? So what they did was they looked at their hippocampi. Now your hippocampi in your brain, uh, you have two, one in, on either side of the hemisphere. They do something really interesting. They, it's where you process working memory. Okay? Now, for taxi drivers here, they found that their hippocampi actually had greater volume. In essence, they were larger than a normal person. They were exercising them more. Taxi drivers who've completed the knowledge, if you give them working memory tests with normal people, they'll outperform you 100 to 1. Their working memory is outstanding. In order to validate that, they, um, they took bus drivers in London and gave them the same series of tests and looked at their hippocampi, and their hippocampi weren't any different than anyone else's because they drive predetermined routes. Okay. Experience is important. So important. By the way, if someone like me ever comes to you and says, hey, we'd like you to be part of an experiment, your response will always be, as long as I'm not part of the control group. You never want to be part of any control group. Uh, here's a good reason why. In this study, researchers were wondering, could we change, could we change a person's brain in a very short period of time through teaching them how to play the piano. Okay? So they took a whole range of adults who had never had any experience playing the piano, and they divided them into three groups. The first group was given roughly an hour to an hour and a half tuition every day for five days. The second group was um, given 
tuition, but they weren't allowed to touch the piano. They were told what they had to do, and they had to imagine doing it. Okay? The third group, the control group, which you never want to be a part of, for an hour and a half each day was put in a room to stare at a piano. They were not given any instructions whatsoever. They just looked at the piano. They weren't allowed to touch it. And here's what they found. When they looked at regions of the brain, brain that are responsible for finger manipulation in terms of playing the piano, they found this. This is the control group. No change. The group that had physical practice, pretty substantive change to the regions of the brain for playing a piano. This is the one that was really interesting to them, however, was this. People who engaged in mental practice almost had the same amount of change. We now know that when you visualize doing something, it can have substantial change to your brain. World-class athletes do this all the time. I was reading a study flying to Perth to speak at a conference saying, if I visualize doing bicep curls, I can actually change the muscle mass in my biceps. You gotta know if I don't have, <laughs> if I never have to go to a place called Jets at this stage of my life, I'm very happy. Here's another great example of how stimulation is important. This wasn't a neuroscience study, this was a study in, in education of kids, um, and this is why one of the biggest determinants of who's gonna do well on those tests that kids are doing over the next few days is postcode, right? We know this. In 1995, researchers went out and looked at vo vocabulary development in kids, okay? So they were looking at three-year-olds and cumulative vocabulary. We know that the average three-year-old will have a cumulative vocabulary of roughly six to 800 words, okay, depending on context. Okay. And here's what they found. So they found in kids who were growing up in a middle SES area, had that, and then they saw that. Okay. Now, there was no functional difference with the kids' brains. There was no difference in intelligence or anything else. The fundamental difference was what? The environment, what was going on? You see, the kids in the low SES group had parents who had to work extended hours often at times, didn't engage with them in what you might want to call literate practices in the way that the other groups were doing, certainly couldn't go to Costco or any other place and buy NAPLAN preparation tests, right? I mean, it's an industry. That industry now is worth millions of dollars, okay? So the be beautiful thing about this study was the researchers in, when they're looking at the kids in low ASES group, worked with parents to change the environment, and in a very short time, those kids who had a working vocabulary of 400 words went to 1,000 words, okay? Context and environment is very important. This is experience-dependent learning. Here's some experience-expectant learning. How many of you have cats? Anybody have cats at home? Researchers took cats, they took kittens at birth and sewed their eyelids together. I don't particularly like cats, I think it's great research. <laughs> Fantastic, fewer cats on the planet, the better. Most mammals have very poor eyesight at birth. Kittens' eyelids are already closed. So what they did was they closed the eyelids and they found over a period of time as they released the eyelids, the longer the eyelids were closed, the more likely it was that the kittens had impaired vision and were completely blind. The interesting thing for the researchers was this. There was no damage to the brain, no damage to the optic nerve, no physical damage whatsoever. In essence, what happened is the kittens didn't have the requisite stimulation to hardwire for sight. It didn't happen. Now, we know this is the case with children, not because we sold their eyelids together, that would be very unethical, um, but about one in 10,000 kids can be born with cataracts on their lenses. And the longer you leave those cataracts on the lenses, the more likely is their vision is going to be impaired. If I develop cataracts, my cataracts are removed, my vision goes back to where it was pre -cat I'm already hardwired for sight. Get the idea? It's the same with all of our senses. This is why infants who have ear infections, highly problematic. They can lose hearing. Okay? So the brain expects certain stimulation early in life, and if it doesn't get it, a lot of things can go wrong. We know that's the case because of the person on my left, on your right. His name's Nikolai Ceausescu. In 1966, his government, he was the president of Romania, his government made it law that every married couple would have a minimum of five children. That was law in Romania. Anybody here with five kids? Clearly, you wouldn't have lasted long in Romania. Any with four? Good for you, that's always good. It's great for our superannuation. Any with three? All right, now imagine this. You're in a country, the president says you have to have five kids. In a country that's very poor, so many people couldn't take care of the kids. So the next part of the grand social plan was this. If you can't take care of your kids, drop them off and we will. Now you might not have heard of his name, but most people here have heard of Romanian orphanages, where children were placed in rooms of the same age. So you might have a room of infants under one, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, you know, separated by age, kind of like in school. Might have as many as 40 kids in there and one person to take care of them, just one. Okay? Now the parents in here, I'm pretty sure you can 
attest to the fact that when kids are little, they can be a little bit demanding. They need a lot of attention. These kids here suffered some major problems. Okay? What you're looking at here are two kids. On the left is an, a normal 11-year-old uh, boy, and on the right is a kid came out of an orphanage. Uh, and what they're asked to do uh, is participate in exercise experiment that, that basically looks at um, social emotional processing. Okay. Now, on the right, see your temporal lobes, which sit right, right about here. When you came in here today, and some of you are upstairs having some of that delicious food that was up there, your temporal lobes were firing. Because they do when you're ever in that kind of context and you're taking in social emotional stimuli and trying to decide, oh, do I want to talk to that person or not? Maybe, maybe not. That's what works, okay? This kid in the here on the right side can't do that. He can't literally read social cues, can't read emotions in faces because never had the requisite stimuli. You have to learn to do that. We're, we have an innate capacity to read emotions, but a lot of it has, is learned behavior. These kids don't have that. Now, what comes of that, however, is this notion that, well, stimulation is so important, surely more would be better. And we have a phenomenon in, in Australia, United States, Canada, most notably in the United States, but increasingly so in Australia, called hot housing. This continuous push of curriculum down on kids. We have something in Queensland called PrEP. I don't like the word. I never did from the beginning. Why didn't we just call it kindergarten? We call it PrEP, and the connotation is we're preparing them for year one. I've seen PrEP classes asking kids to do in PrEP what year ones are doing. There's a developmental psychologist on the planet that would say that's good practice. Now we have pre-PrEP. We're prepping for PrEP. Okay? So we're going to get kids in pre-PrEP doing what the PrEPs are doing, the PrEPs are doing what the year ones are doing. It's all askew. I was in Sydney to speak at a conference. I saw a billboard that said, university begins in kindergarten. No, it doesn't. Kindergarten begins in kindergarten. There's increasing pressure on kids to perform tasks that they're not developmentally ready for, and that's highly problematic. We have increased generations of kids today are more stressed and anxious than any previous generation. We should be asking ourselves, why is that? Why is that? So doing more is not necessarily better. Now, there's a, a great book um, by a friend of mine in the United States named, and the book's called Einstein Never Used Flashcards. It's a really good look at why trying to do too much too soon can cause more harm than good. Are you aware that over 500 kids last year in this state were expelled from prep or suspended? Four-year-olds being suspended or expelled. They were lashing out. Of course, the behavior was deemed inappropriate or violent, but they were lashing out. I don't think somewhere down the track, in the space of a short time, suddenly kids at four years of age have evolved into Satan spawn. I don't think that's the case. I think we've got a whole lot of kids being asked to do things they can't do, and when they can't, they get frustrated. And if you don't have a good degree of emotional regulation, which four-year-olds often don't, you lash out. So more may be less, and we're seeing this in many countries. And I, I speak about, about this quite passionately because some of the work that I've been doing looking at stress in kids in three different countries is astounding. The number of kids who are suffering from anxiety disorders at four and five. It is a worrying trend. Now, one of the reasons why you can't hyperstimulate learning, you have to be very careful, is you have a very important material in your brain called myelin. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Have you heard of the white matter of the brain? Somebody referred to white matter and gray matter? Well, when you're born, you have a lot of gray matter, not very much white matter. Over the course of time, that shifts. The white matter in your brain is myelin. It's a fat. It's a fatty material. The brain is fully myelinated in your 20s. So we take about three decades of our life to become fat heads. But when it's myelinated, it works really well. See, what myelin does is it wraps around the axons of neurons and acts as an insulator and conductor so that neurons can speak better to each other. During adolescence, myelin increased about 100%. Myelin is a material that breaks down of people who suffer from multiple sclerosis. In essence, neurons can't talk to each other anymore. There is nothing you can do to hyperstimulate myelin production. You can't. It just happens. Now, what we know, interestingly enough, though, last year is a huge breakthrough in science. Researchers in Sweden found they could take adult rats. We do a lot of research with rats when it comes to the brain because the, how the brain develops in trajectory is very similar to humans. But they found they could stimulate myelin growth in adult rats, which is a huge breakthrough. They're doing it in research in terms of preventable diseases like multiple sclerosis and, and Alzheimer's and dementia. But to date, we can't do that in humans. What we do know, however, is that when the brain is myelinating, and it doesn't myelinate in a nice linear fashion, different parts of the brain myelinate at different times. What we do know is that when a region of the brain is myelinating, it's very responsive to certain stimuli. And we can call those learning windows. 
Okay? Here's a few. We know that if you want kids to learn how to play an instrument, you don't wait till they're 12 or 13. You start them early in life. Now that's not to say that as an adult, if you've never played an instrument, you can't learn. But if we were to take an adult who's never played the piano and, and a four-year-old and give them the same amount of tuition over time, the four-year-old will be playing sooner and better, okay? Because they're very responsive, neurologically very responsive to that stimuli. Okay? Language, it doesn't make any sense to wait until a child is 13 or 12 and introduce them to a language other than English. If you want kids to learn a language, you start early in life, very early. We also know that learning a second language enhances your native language. We also know everyone in here speaks English, but many of you sound very different than I do. You have an accent. You sound very strange at times. And some of the vocabulary you use, I'm not sure where you get it, but it's just mind-boggling. Oh, speaking of vocabulary, I'm, in the not-too-distant future, it's coming up. There's a competition, a football competition, isn't there, um, between this state and New South Wales, um, origin of species or something? Um, I say this to every teacher I meet. If you're very sincere about enhancing kids' literacy, you cannot support a team that cannot say its name properly. There is no such thing as Marone. Right? It's really important for you to know that. And if you're going to try going down that pathway, then soon you'll be howling at the moan and stirring your, co stirring your coffee with a spoon, going to the zoo to see a babone. <laughs> Language development happens early in life. We have an accent. At about 13 months is when the brain starts to differentiate between sounds of language and stops being able to hear sounds. If you take a group of Japanese people in here who have never heard English before, and I put up the words robber, rubber, lover, and say, repeat after me, robber, rubber, lover, what you will hear is robber, rubber, rubber. They literally can't hear the sound or differentiate the sound. My mom, born in Canada, her first language is not English. It's Ukrainian. Consequently, most of my early life, I thought Thursday was Thursday. My mom cannot physically make that sound. Okay? So if you want to, kids to learn a second language, you don't wait until they're 12 or 13 as adolescents and say, guess what, you're going to have some fun doing lot. No, I'm not. It doesn't interest me. I have a great deal of compassion for lot people because I think if the first time you work with kids is when they're 12 or 13, that's a hard slog. Now again, you don't have to believe me, you can look this up. This is the times that you can engage kids. Here's something that's really important. Impulse control, emotional regulation, delayed gratification, they all fit under the same umbrella. For many years, scientists believed that impulse control was purely innate. To some degree it is, but we now know it can be trained. Impulse control is incredibly important. It can be trained very simply in this way. It's just okay to say no to a child as long as you are consistent when you say no, when the boundaries and borders are consistent. Okay. By the way, the brain work, you, this is how the brain operates. The brain is designed to do two things in this order, survive and learn in that order. Your survival mechanisms are well and truly firing before many of the higher order thinking processes of your brain are in, in, in line. Um, parents in here know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's a good example. Your son, daughter, they're three or four years of age. They come into the kitchen. You're making dinner. And they say to you, Dad, I'm hungry. Can I have a biscuit? Now, you've read all the good parenting books. You know, on your shelf, you've got Nurturing Healthy the Mind, Dr. Michael Nagel. <laughs> Cheap plug. And you say to your son or daughter, look, Harry, I'm sorry, dinner's going to be ready in about 10 minutes. If I give you something to eat now, it's going to ruin your appetite, and you won't want to eat. So how about if you just go off and do whatever, you know, play Call of Duty or whatever you're doing, <laughs> and I'll call you in 10 minutes, and we can have a scrumptious meal together. Now, every parent in here, I will think, will agree with this. I'll bet my everything I own on this, you are not going to have a child look at you and go, you know, Dad, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I'll just come back in 10 minutes and we'll sit down to a lovely meal. <laughs> Most of you, if you, who does not have children? Get ready for it if you're planning on it, because what you're going to have is this, but I'm starving. And they'll go into a little fetal position on the floor <laughs> because in their brain, they literally think if they don't put something in their mouths, right, that they're going to die. And it's always interesting to see how long before parents go into uh, survival mode. Survive and learn. Okay? Now, at about three or four years of age, it's really, well, up to that time, really important to ensure the boundaries and borders are consistent. Because the brain's a patterning mechanism. It looks for patterns, and it does it really well. I'll give this as an example. Right now, this, you know, your eyes take in about 90,000 bits of information every second. You're not even aware of it because you feel most of that's filtered out. But at this stage in your life, all you really need is the first letter, the last letter, and the context, and you can read. 
because the brain knows the pattern. The English language is a very difficult language in terms of syntax, grammar, spelling. I mean, why do we have a C and a K? Right? Or an S for that matter. So this is how your brain works. It looks for patterns. Now, how important is this? Well, have any of you heard of the marshmallow test? If you've never heard of the marshmallow test, you can go um, home tonight and go on YouTube and put in the marshmallow test and see a contemporary version of it. Basically, it's fashioned after a study that was done by Walter Mitchell at Stanford University in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Stanford University had childcare centers on campus, and what Mitchell and his colleagues did was quite interesting. They had a room, and they'd go in the room, and on a table, they would, they used marshmallows, sometimes they used chocolate, they used different things. They changed the variables, but the marshmallow's nice. So they'd put a marshmallow there, and they'd say to the four-year-old, the five-year-old, look, I just have to go out of the room for a minute. If you don't eat this, you can have another one when I get back. And then they'd go out and they'd watch behind the glass and see what the kids were doing. Now, ostensibly, they found there were three types of kids. They found that there was the child that would sit there like this. Then there's a the second child, sit on their hands. <laughs> then there was a the third child, often they didn't even leave the room and they were into it. Right, uh, I've seen a video with one kid, the chocolate all over their face. Did you eat anything? No. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about this was they followed these kids through their lives, many of them. When they got to school, they found some interesting things. So here's the numbers. From 1968 to 1974, 550 kids. How important was it? Well. The more impulse control you had, the better you did as a college student trying to get into, or as a high school student trying to get in college in the SATs, right? You, were, you did better in IQ tests, tests that measured uh, concentration, uh, anything that had to do with self-reliance, confidence, and judgment, you did better at if you had those patterns early in life. By 27 to 32, most of the people who had great impulse control were very successful in life. Those that didn't failed miserably in many aspects of their life, health and otherwise. Midlife, this was really interesting. This was done about four years ago, five years ago, where they actually had some of those same kids as adults and they scanned their brains under experimental conditions and found that the reward centers for people who had bad impulse control were highly active when provided a particular stimuli. In other words, it was almost like the analytical part of their brain shut down completely when a reward was offered. And many of these people suffer with all kinds of problems. Right? So we know this is important. We know it's important. About four years of age, for those of you, by the way, who doesn't have children? Okay, be prepared, because I'm about four years of age, your son or daughter will come up and they go, and you'll say to your son, Harry, we have to go to the shops. Why do we have to go to the shops? We have to buy food. Why do we have to buy food? We have to eat. Why do we have to eat? Well, you know, if we didn't eat, we could get sick, we could die. Why would we die? On or about four years of age, the average four and five will ask why 25 to 250 times a day That'll last about six to eight months in boys and about 12 months in girls. I suspect you'll see parental alcohol consumption grow exponentially as well. <laughs> It'll drive you crazy. And there's nothing you can do about it. Harry, we have to go to the shops. Why do we have to go to the shops? Why do you ask? Why do you ask? Why do I ask? Um, at that stage in life, the brain actually makes a shift now from not just taking in information, but wanting to understand how things work. And you know kids' brains are maturing when they actually start asking questions that have answers. And then they move into puberty and adolescence and it just gets annoying. I'm going to skip this and go here. Here's something really important. You've heard of neuroplasticity. We've seen many amazing examples of how it, it's enacted in very different ways. What's really interesting is that all of us should start thinking about the thing between our ears more like a muscle than an organ, because we have growing evidence that tells us that the more we exercise it by doing new or novel things, the healthier it stays. Okay? Now, new or novel things are not this. When's MasterChef on, anyway? Right. Newer novel things are things that you go out of your comfort zone. They're completely novel. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to go and do a marathon, but it might be you take up how to play Sudoku. You might take up an instrument, something completely different, because when you do that, you're actually developing neural growth in your brain. Right? So it's kind of like the body. If you exercise it and take care of it, it doesn't have to break down. Okay? That's the important message here, but you have to take care of it. Yes, that's the governator, how things change. In terms of how, when people think about the brain, we're almost through the neuroscience and the early stuff, and then we're going to talk about adolescence, but when people talk about the brain, they generally refer to three regions. They do so because of primary responsibilities. Please know these things are intimately connected, okay? 
If I say human brain to you, most people will think of the cerebrum of the brain, which are the hemispheres of the brain, because it's the most thing you're most familiar with. Well, primary responsibilities of that are thinking and consciousness occur in your cerebrum. You have four lobes. You have the frontal lobe, you have the, oops, don't know why that happened, doesn't matter. At the back is the occipital lobe, temporal lobe, and then the frontal lobe again. The most important for you to remember as uh, parents and teachers is the frontal lobe is the last thing to fully mature, okay? Particularly the right prefrontal cortex, which isn't fully online until you're in your 20s. Again, most of the hard work done by about 18 or 19, but there are some caveats to that that I'm gonna share with you in a minute. In the middle of your brain is something called the limbic system. Primary responsibilities there are emotion and memory, and the base of the brain is the brainstem. Primary responsibilities there are fight or flight responses. Many things you're doing now, you don't think about. Your respiration, circulation is all monitored through your brainstem. If you suffer some measure of trauma in your neck, it can kill you for that reason. Importantly, the brain kind of matures from the inside out and from the back to the front. Okay, so the last thing that fully matures are the analytical parts of your brain. And it serves us well. If we wouldn't survive long if it was the other way around, right? If the analytical part of our brain matured before our fight or flight responses, you might be out of the water somewhere at Malulaba, standing in the water and you see this fin coming towards you and you think, what a magnificent beast. I do believe that's a white pointer. And you'd be dead. If you're like me, I see if I'm in Mulaney in seconds if I see this thing. Um, because fight or flight responses kick in and you're out of the water, okay? Back to the front and inside out. Kids and adolescents, their emotional part of their brain and the surviving are firing long before the analytical part of the brain is. So what does this mean in terms of early learning? Here are a few things we know that are really important. I'm gonna put all these up and just talk about a couple of them. Oops. We know that talk is important, we know that routine is important, we know that sensory stimulation is important. We also know that technology is not that important. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay, this is not good developmental practice by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not anti-technology. It might sound like I am. I'm not a Luddite. But I will share some things with you about technology shortly that suggest to us that we're spending a whole lot of time and energy and money in a place that we really don't need to. We know this is not good, inappropriate practice, hyperstimulation, and preparation doesn't begin in kindergarten. So what's really important in the early stages of kids' life in terms of learning? All the research that we have in terms of all aspects of development tells us that, interestingly enough, from about birth to age eight, the most important thing in a child's life is play. The most important thing. Not something you do when all the hard work is done. Now, for whatever reason, in Australia, Canada to some degree, United States, play's become a bit of a pejorative, right? It's something negative. It's, we're too busy to do play. We've got too many things to do. We have a curriculum we have to accomplish. It's really problematic because we know that self-directed play, the kind of play that kids engage with where they make up their own games, their own rules and everything else, sets them up in terms of all aspects of social, emotional, language development, physical development. We also know that mature dramatic play, when they dress up to be something else, when they put capes around their neck and they pretend they're Superman, enhances metacognition and cognition. We have decades of research that tell us this. We don't have any research that says that learn, teaching four-year-olds how to code is gonna help them. So play experiences are incredibly important. I'm not gonna get on that bandwagon too much or soapbox. Let's go here now. Are you feeling a bit tired? A little bit? I'm gonna wake up your brain then. This is another part I like to do with people because you're gonna look really silly in a moment. You're looking really tired. Can you pop your right arm? Your elbow just like this. And using your elbow in block letters, can you spell your surname please? Using your elbow. Eastern European ancestry here, that's fantastic. Pick a leg, maybe right leg, and from the knee down, spin in a circle. Good, now do both simultaneously. <laughs> the only thing better than watch a whole bunch of adults doing this is looking at people in the tune. <laughs> All right, feeling awake? Hey, we're gonna talk about adolescence. Now, when I talk about adolescence, I like to put in a context for you. The word adolescence is a social construction. If I talk to parents and teachers in different countries, which I have, and I say, what's an adolescent? I get many different responses. I link the word adolescence to pubescence. Pubescence is a medical term denoting a change in the reproductive system. We know that for some kids, that's happening about 10, 11, 12 years of age. It signifies a change in the reproductive system, also parallels a change in the neuro neurology of a kid. 
Okay? Most of the change occurs from about 12 to 19. Okay? Critical years, probably about 13 or 14 to 17, 18. It's hard to say exactly when because no two human brains are the same and no two sets of experiences are the same. That's a rough estimate. I'm going to give you an analogy about understanding adolescence. This works for me on so many levels because I'm Canadian. And you can use this. Some of you want to take this. You might want to manipulate it in terms of a Queensland, New South Wales context. It doesn't matter. It's a, a communique between a Canadian and U.S. Naval Authority. It goes like this. U.S. ship, please divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. The Canadian reply, I recommend you divert your course 15 degrees south to avoid a collision. This is the captain of U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. No. I say again, you divert your course. This is US, the aircraft carrier USS Coral Sea. We are a large warship of the U.S. Navy. Divert your course now. This is a lighthouse. Your call. <laughs> you got to know that just works for me on so many levels. Um, how many of you have been in a conversation with an adolescent recently and it's kind of going like that? And it doesn't matter what you say, you're wrong. Always remember when you get into an argument with an adolescent, it's like two pigs fighting in mud. Both of you are going to get dirty, but only one of you is going to enjoy it. But you need to remember, you have to be the adolescent or the lighthouse. Okay? You have to be the lighthouse, because what's going on inside their heads can be completely different. So what does the research tell us? Well, the research tells us, first of all, the image here is, is not indicative of adolescence. It's for all you people who have to deal with them. That's you. Hang in there. Here's what we know. This is often very difficult for teachers and educators and parents, for that matter, in North America, where kids don't wear school uniforms. You see, because they can arrive to school in the attire of the day, whatever that might be. My son's 16. He'll be 17 in July. He now stands about that much taller than me. Um, later tonight, I'll take him to football training. He's playing soccer. When I say football, that's the only football I recognize. I don't get that. Um, and he does things at the end of training sometimes that are very annoying for me. He'll come off because he's hot, and he'll take his shirt off. Really? Put that back on. Yeah, I know how you feel, son. <laughs> um, for all intents and purposes, he has the stature and physique of an adult male. But I know what's going on inside his head is very different. You need to remember that. Here's some examples. Imagine a study where you take a group of teenagers, they're roughly 14 to 17 and adults, 35 plus. You hook them up to MRI technology, you give them a task. The task is a very simple one. They have a device, on the device are four buttons. Happy, sad, angry, surprised. Happy, sad, angry, surprised. They have to memorize that. They're shown the image of a face. When the face pops up, press the button. What emotion do you see? Happy, sad, angry, or surprised. Get the idea? Scanning their brains while they're doing it. Well, interestingly enough, for the, oops, sorry, go back, press the wrong button. For the adults, most of the neural activity is happening in the frontal lobes. For the teenagers, most of the activity is happening in their limbic system. In other words, teenagers will use a completely different mechanization of the mind to read emotions. And here's what we find when that happens. More often than not, they get it wrong and they're slower at it. They often see anger when there isn't any anger. And how many of you have ever had a feeling in your gut when something wasn't right? You think, oh, this just doesn't feel right to me. Maybe you're in a parking lot somewhere. Or just Well, that's actually not your gut, it's your amygdala. Your amygdala is a region of your brain that attaches emotional value to things, but one of the things that's responsible for it is detecting fear. When it goes to a fight or flight or fear response, it starts turning your gut nuts. And teenagers are perpetually in nuts. They tend to react with that and they may overreact. Here's another example, published by the National Institute of Alcohol and Drug Abuse in the United States. Their interest, what engages dopamine in the human brain? Now, dopamine is a powerful neurotransmitter of the brain. When your dopamine is elevated, you feel really good. Um, you could drive home from here today, turn on your radio, song comes on that elicits a powerful, positive emotional response, and your dopamine can elevate about 9%. We know that cocaine elevates dopamine about 20%. I think the NRL can attest to that. <laughs> I just try to be topical. Um, we also know that methamphetamine seems to elevate dopamine about 35%, okay, which is why it's so highly addictive. Okay, so dopamine is really powerful. So the National Institute of Alcohol and Drug Abuse wanted to look at dopamine in a, in a clinical condition, experimental condition, how it can be elevated. And it was very simple. You could see the age groups they took, and they hooked up neurotechnology. See, because dopamine can switch on like that. What they did, rather than showing images, they had a series of statements. The first statement said something like this. We're going to have you participate in a study. Now, if I'd shown you before slides, you'd see two slides that kind of look like this. We're going to have you participate in a study. Next statement. Because you're going to participate in this, we want to give you some cash. We want to pay you. If I show you the before slides, you see two slides that look like this. 
Happy days. Woohoo! Dopamine elevates. Everyone's happy. Watch the videotape. You can see the you know, yeah, okay, yeah, that's good. Next statement, and these all had a voiceover as well. Okay? Next statement was, in order to get the cash, we have a series of tasks we want you to do. And that's what they saw. You can see the body language on the teenagers looking at stuff, going, we're going to have you, we're going to have you, huh? Now think about it. If you can't motivate 12 and 17 year olds with cash, I'm not so sure Gold Star Center program is going to do much good either. Okay? What we know about teenagers in terms of motivation and rewards is that if you're going to offer a reward, it needs to be immediate and substantive. 15-year-olds okay? don't care about what's happening to them in a week, male or female. They want things now. Frontal lobes, here's some things that are happening. So the things you see in boxes here are all part of your limbic system, your hippocampus, amygdala, hypothalamus. What separates us from all other species is these things, the frontal lobes and the things that they do. All of these things, planning, anticipation, you know, higher order thinking. Um, kids can do that to some degree, but as we get older, we get much better at it because our brains mature. One of the things we're very good at as we get older is the mediation and inhibition of inappropriate emotional responses. I'll give you a real life example. My daughter, I mentioned before, her name's Madeline. She goes by Maddie. If I call her Madeline, she gets very upset, but she's not here, so Madeline. She comes home from school. She was in high school a couple years ago in Brisbane. Comes home from school one day. I say, hi, Maddie, how are you? Would you mind taking out the trash? <sighs> All right, she does. And she comes back, and you'd think I'd know better given what I do. I say, oh, look, Maddie, I'm sorry, I forgot. Could you take out the recyclables too? What, do you think i got nothing better to do, Dad? Jeez, I just get home and all you can say is take out the trash, take out... Why doesn't Harry do it? You know, he never does anything around here. I know you love him more than I do, but that's no excuse. Gee, I just got home. I need to contact Stephanie. We haven't Facebook in 10 minutes. <laughs> Has this happened to you? Does this sound familiar? Oh, please say yes or I'm in a world of pain. <laughs> Have some of you maybe perpetuated this on your parents? You recall back, go, oh yeah, I remember doing that. That was pretty fun. Um... At a stage in life right now for teenagers, a lot of them are, have heightened emotions and they tend to see the world very differently and ask him to do something. You'd think I asked him to go and kill the dog, okay? Inhibition and mediation of emotions improves. So there's a bit of a mismatch. This is really important. We know that kids, their limbic system, their survival things are well and truly firing and operating before higher order parts of their brain are. I mentioned myelin. Myelin increases about 100% during adolescence. It increases about two years sooner in girls than in boys. There's a two-year difference. Here's something that's quite fascinating. Researchers came across in the early 1990s, something called synaptic pruning. We knew it happened, but they didn't know to what extent it happened in the teenage years to this. So what goes on is quite, quite fascinating. And I'd like to put up a, an image of a sculptor here, a classical art piece, because what the brain tends to do then is get rid of unused synaptic connections. So it's like a sculptor. Chip away at a piece of marble to your left with a masterpiece. So how does the brain decide what's important? It's a very simple adage that neuroscientists say all the time. Use it or lose it. Okay, Jay Geed, one of the leading researchers in the world, said this once on television. If an adolescent is doing music, sports, or academics, those are the connections that will be hardwired. If it's lying on the couch or playing video games or watching MTV, those are the cells and connections that will survive. Okay? Now, he's going to say, I'm not making a value judgment here. We know that what happens in the teenage years gets hardwired, it stays. What you stop doing disappears. Again, this is why growing up in Canada, I grew up in the prairies in Saskatchewan, it made no sense to introduce me to something called French when I was in year seven. I did French in year seven, French in year eight. By the time I was in year nine, I didn't do any French. By the time I was in year 10, I had no French. Nothing, except for the words, je ne sais pas. That's the only French I knew. Some people laugh because you know what I'm saying. What am I saying? Pardon me? I don't understand or I don't know. Because that's what I did in the French class. When the teacher asked me something, she'd say something. I'd hear some stuff coming out of her mouth. And I'd just look at her and go, oh, je ne sais pas. <laughs> she'd ask me another question. And I had different intonation. Oh, je ne sais pas. I got A's in French for knowing absolutely nothing. Um, now, this has real Im Im interesting implications for researchers looking at the impact of technology. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the key point here is, for teenagers, what they do over time stays, what they don't disappears. And the brain has to do that. If it didn't, it would get muddled in confusion. It works to becoming more expedient and more efficient. So pruning occurs, and we have this. You don't have to remember all these. And it doesn't really completely balance out till mid-20s. One of the most interesting implications of this is research that's just been conducted recently in the United States found this out purely by accident. It's kind of interesting. It's Monday. Tomorrow, I've got a really busy day at uni. It's my busy day. I teach from noon till 8 o'clock. 
okay? Series of lectures that I do. And I also teach on Wednesday. This Friday, I might decide to go out. It's been known to happen. I mentioned this to your leadership team last time I was here. My drink of choice is New Zealand Saint Blanc. Please remember that. Future reference. So on Friday night, I might decide to go out. <laughs> might have a glass of New Zealand Saint Blanc. Might have two. On or about the third, my limbic system will start sending messages to my frontal lobe. Some of you might have experienced something similar. Things like, particularly if I go to the men's, boy, are you good looking. <laughs> and can you sing? It's on or about that time that this happens. My frontal lobes will send other messages to my limbic system. Hey, hey, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Look. You're getting a bit on in life. You're a bit follically challenged. You don't look as good as you think anymore. And when you sing, you're often better at, at it when you're you know, in the shower with good acoustics on your own. So you really got to start thinking about, do you really want to have another drink as have long and go towards La La Land? Do you want to end up you know, the next morning with the parents at Harry's football training looking at you again going, <laughs> or do you want to curb that thing right now? Start drinking mineral water. Put your car keys away. Probably have to Uber home all those things. Interestingly enough, that conversation that we can have as adults where the frontal lobes turn down our limbic system, where we call cold cognition of analytical thought, temper hot cognition of let's sing, doesn't seem to come online until about 25. In the United States right now, where the legal drinking age in all 50 states is 21, uh, there's discussion about raising that. Because the number one cause of death for teenagers in that country, and big in this country too, is um, alcohol-related deaths in terms of violence and or car accidents. And if your brain can't tell you to stop, that's highly problematic. Neurotransmitters. These things are really interesting. Melatonin. Melatonin does some amazing things during teenage years. Do you know what melatonin is? It's a neurotransmitter in the brain that induces sleep. You can go to a naturopath, you can get melatonin. If you have trouble sleeping, you take melatonin, put a little bit of liquid under your tongue, it helps you sleep. Uh, just be careful, because if you have too much, you have really psychedelic dreams. <laughs> I've been told. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing about melatonin is it seems to fluctuate in teenagers. Um, so what kind of happens is on or about 12 or 13 years of age, some of you would notice this with your kids, sleeping patterns change. Okay? So the release of melatonin in my brain, and most people in here, is going to happen somewhere between, depending on lifestyle, but generally speaking, somewhere between 9 and 10 o'clock at night. Okay? That's usually when you start feeling a bit sleepy. Um, and the breakdown of that melatonin for, for us is going to happen around 6 a.m. Okay? In teenagers, that shifts about two hours. Okay? So the release of melatonin isn't happening in kids who are 14 or 15 years of age until about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. The corollary to that is it doesn't break down until about 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure some of you have seen this when kids arrive at school and they look like members of The Walking Dead. All right. Now, we, there are schools, there was a school in the United States that s started its start time one hour later for a year to see what the results. So they, instead of going from 9 till 3, they went from 10 till 4. And in the space of the year, academic outcomes improved and behavior problems diminished markedly because kids were awake. All right. um, now, I'm not suggesting you do that here, but what I would suggest is that if you're working with senior kids in your school, what you don't want to have them do is sit at a desk for a long period of time when they get off the bus or come home to school because they're going to fall asleep. So whether you're teaching English, math, or whatever, you've got to get them moving, right? And it might just be you have them sit for 10 minutes and you have moved to a different part of the room. Now, it might be contrary to what you think is good practice, but I can pretty much guarantee that if you have them come and sit in a space for a long period of time, they're not with you. They might look like that they are, but they certainly aren't. So we know, and by the way, and kids are chron chronically sleep deprived. Now, part of the problem with this, huge problem, is when you sleep at night is when a lot of your memories are formed and learning is actually taking place. Okay? Memory con consolidation happens during your sleeping time. It's really important, particularly in deep sleep. So we have a lot of kids who are sleep deprived. The other thing, too, that's really interesting, and I say this, kids hate when I, sometimes I go to school, maybe I'll come and talk to your kids, some of your kids. I often say to the kids, you know, I've been at schools where I've talked to kids, and I'm, tell, I'm going to talk to your parents in a little while. You're not going to like what I'm about to tell your parents. They're like, what? What are you going to tell them? Well, here's something we know. If your kids have laptops and stuff on, you want them to shut those things off about 8.30 and 9 o'clock. There's now a growing body of research that tells us the blue rays, and this is for you too as well, the blue light that's emitted from those devices can delay the release of melatonin up to two hours or longer. So if kids are on their devices till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, 
They're already, they're already sleep delayed. That, they're not going to fall asleep until 2 in the morning or 1.30 in the morning. And then they're going to get up at 7 to go to school. Highly problematic. Okay? And there's lots of evidence that tells us this. Same with you as adults. Serotonin is another interesting neurotransmitter. Serotonin acts as a calming mechanism. It's, it's, a, it's a great neurochemical. When your serotonin levels are normal, you feel pretty good. People who suffer from chronic depression are often prescribed a medication that term the Prozac to enhance the uptake of serotonin in the brain. Um, you can eat foods rich in an amino acid called tryptophan, which also enhances serotonin uptake. It's not as powerful as Prozac, but probably healthier for you. Two foods uh, that have a lot of tryptophan are bananas, which is good, and uh, one thing that I think why Canadians are pretty easygoing people, and all of you need to get on board with this, turkey. Turkey's loaded with tryptophan, and we look for any reason to kill that bird and eat it. <laughs> it's a sad state of affairs in this country that I can only ever buy a turkey in November when Christmas is around the corner. So I buy four, and I freeze three of them, so I can have one every three months. This is why I'm such a jolly fellow. <laughs> the Australians need to eat more turkey. It'll do your world of good. Now, what's interesting about serotonin during the teenage years is in females, in a female's monthly cycle, when estrogen is elevated, so too are serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, and they have particular behavior. They you typically feel pretty good. Um, everything seems fairly positive. When estrogen goes down in monthly cycle, so too do those chemicals. In adolescent girls, serotonin seems to tank even further. We don't know why this is. We do see it. We think this is why we see greater incidences of um, depression in adolescent girls and depressive behaviors. And we'll talk about that shortly. Conversely, with boys, Dopamine is exceedingly elevated. Okay? When dopamine is elevated, and this is extent, there's a, the, the reward system of the brain, the mechanisms of the brain that evaluate rewards are engorged with dopamine in adolescent males. Right? And when your dopamine is elevated, you feel like you can take on the world. And you might try by doing silly things, like trying to ride on the top of a train. Right? More young males are killed doing stupid things than anything else. Right. There's a caveat to that we're going to talk about, but it's incredibly elevated. Okay. So here's some things we know, and I'm going to share a couple of um, uh, studies with you that kind of highlight this, particularly these last three things. Poor modulation of emotion, heightened sensation taking, and more risky impulsive behaviors. All right. So I want to tell you a little bit about this study because I think it's fascinating. You can see the ages. These are all females. Okay. Can I ask your name? Jenny. Is that right? So people like Jenny are asked to participate in this study, and they say, Jenny, I want you to come in. We're going to hook up some imaging technology. Oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning. You know those big MRI machines that most of you have seen on TV if you haven't had a, a scan done? That's kind of old technology. We now have the capacity to sit you down in something and scan your brain as you engage in tasks, because we do this with kids. Because if you've never, how many people here have had an MRI? Quite a few. Does this sound familiar? Be perfectly calm. Relax. Don't move. Does that sound familiar? And then do the researchers, the medical, they go behind triple plane glass and go, are you calm? Good. Don't move. Everything will be fine. And then they turn the thing on. And it's very disconcerting because it, it's magnets fire and they kind of wow, wow, and you're like, don't move. Now, imagine, if you may, taking an eight-year-old boy and saying, don't move. Be perfectly still. How many of you have sons? I mentioned my son. He's a great kid. Watching television with him is exhausting for me. Most of the time, he's upside down. Or he's molded to the furniture in a way I only wish I could bend. But we now have the machines available that actually, they kind of looks like a big hair dryer, and you sit down in it. It's kind of shaped like this round thing. I mean, it'd be great to have one at the school, wouldn't it? <laughs> Trevor, come here. Yep, that's what I thought. Nothing happened in there. Um, <laughs> So we can take someone like Jenny and say, Jenny, we're going to have you play a video ga a game. And in this game, what's going to happen is we're testing your reflexes. So we've got a character who's going to throw a ball here to a character. Then they're going to throw a ball to you. That hand is you. Don't press the button too soon because you'll drop the ball. Wait till the ball hits your hand, then press the button. We want to see how accurate you are. Have fun. Sounds simple enough, right? So Jenny comes in. She plays the game. And this is happens. Bum, bum, happy days, happy days, happy days. Bum, 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 bum. Somewhere down the line. She gets left out. Interestingly enough, the younger the girls are, the angrier they get. And the more their anxiety and stress elevates. When you watch videotape of the participants, it's fantastic. Now, here's the other thing that's really interesting. When everyone's playing and having a nice time, and everyone's included, 
all the neural activity is here in the frontal lobes. Press the button, press the button, press the button. The minute the exclusion happens, the younger girls are, their frontal lobes kind of disappear and their limbic system lights up. Lights up like crazy. And you watch the body language, you can see it played out in real time. Because the adults are doing this. Press the button, press, huh, must be broken. The younger girls are like, what's wrong with this thing? They literally hammer on the thing to make it happen. We know that social exclusion for teenage girls is very problematic. That's why girls, that's why girls engage in what I call aggression in pink. Right? That's how girls bully. You want to make somebody angry? You exclude them. Right? Hypersensitive. Now here's something interesting for boys. What, what's your name? Sorry. Steve. Steve. So we take someone like Steve, we put him in the fencing machine, we say, Steve, we're going to have you play a game, same sort of thing, we're going to check your reaction timing. We're going to get you driving. Now the age groups in this study are roughly the same age as the girls. I think they were 12 and 13, 16, 17, and then they had our else 38 plus. Get you driving. Now, by and large, no fundamental differences with Steve and anybody else. Then they say, Steve, this is the elegant part of the study, I want you to come back, Steve, and bring a friend, or two. So Steve does. Steve's friends are allowed to be in the vicinity where he is. He's sitting in the machine playing the game. They're not allowed to say or contact or anything, and this is what they find. The younger they are, the more likely it is they're going to run risks. So here's what we know. 13-year-old boys are actually more risk-averse than their fathers when they're alone. The minute they're with their friends, their frontal lobes disappear, and they become animals. They're going to do anything to take risks. Again, begs the question, do you want a pea plater driving a car with his mates in the back seat? Because he's more inclined to try and run a yellow light or speed than he is if he's alone or with his dad. Right? How many of you read or heard of John Gray's book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus? If you've read it, did somebody say it's a good book? <laughs> Some, if, you read it, uh, you, if you haven't read it, what John Gray advocates a lot of times is, you know, when males go into emotional upheaval, they'll go into a cave, right? And the females in their lives should never go into that cave, ever. Even if they're invited, don't. It's just a trap. Don't go there. Um, and I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Ruben and Raquel Gurr, neuroscientists at the University of Pennsylvania, who did a fascinating study suggesting this isn't too far from reality. What they did was they took men and women, adult men and women in the United States, they were African-American, Caucasian, Hispanic, um, Asian, hooked them up to MRI technology, scanning their brains, and gave them a task. It was a very simple task. They were lying down, looking up at the ceiling, and on the ceiling they would shine an image, a black and white image of a face. The first series of stud studies they did were all women, faces of women. The participant's job was to determine, do you think that person is happy or not happy? So on one side of the ceiling was a Y for yes, for happy, painted, and an N for not happy. They were given a flashlight, a torch. Get the idea? So an image would come up, and this is what you'd see. When you watch videotapes, it's fantastic. You see the women doing this. And they're telling them, we're going to see how quick you are and how accurate you are. Then the men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Men were slower and almost always wrong. <laughs> now, when they were scanning the neural activity of the brain, what was really telling for the women, there was a part of the limbic system, part of the right prefrontal cortex lit up in a blue kind of color, which in neurospeak means, hey, this is easy. For the men, almost all areas of the brain were lit up like a house on fire, saying, this is bloody difficult. <laughs> So they changed the parameters of that. They did a study with only men's faces, and then they did a study with men's and women's faces, intermingled them. And women outperformed men all the time, were faster and more accurate. Men struggled with every one of those tests. Reading emotions is not something we do well, and we're going to talk about that. Hey, if you don't believe me, just go to Bunnings on a Sunday. Right? You'll see a lot of emotionless men walking around there, and they're actually quite happy. You just don't know it. <laughs> okay, but there are some differences. I mean, if we look at differences, there are many differences. You know, Alzheimer's research is looking at, you know, most genuine learning difficulties exist in males. You know, most genuine learning problems, most disorders are more prevalent in males, and there's a lot of different theories about why that is. But there are some differences, okay? Um, let me share with you one that I think you might find really interesting, or a couple, I suppose. One structural difference is quite interesting. 
So, 17 days after conception, the neural tube forms, neurons migrate. And Did you know that all brains start out female? I don't know if you're aware of that. All brains have the same template. It's female. In first trimester, when the, when the sexual identity of that child is determined by the hormones and the testes start to develop, it'll start marinating that brain in testosterone if it's male, signifying change. The brain will have to change. Okay? Now, it's interesting, though, what, when a brain starts to do this, there's a, a particular type, not all neurons are the same, there's a particular type of neuron that will continue to migrate in females, but it doesn't in males. It kind of stays clumped in one particular area. I heard a female neuroscientist say once at a conference, it's almost like in utero, boys are already goofing off. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. Okay? But what's interesting about that is, is this. Because of that, males can typically bend objects in their mind very easily. You give these kind of psychometric tests to men and women, males outperform women about 100 to 1. Okay? You can see that I can't tell you the number of times my beautiful partner looks at a map. Oh, yeah. All right. so now, I mean, we have GPS, so whether that's an advantage now, who cares? Um, but it does allow us, if you look at chess masters, uh, people who do Rubik's cubes, all those things, bending those things in mind very quickly. That has implications for sometimes the maths that we do. But if you look at hemispheres, um, hemispheric research, by the way, if you go to um, a bookstore and you say something, you see a book that says, improve your right brain, leave it there. In fact, if you see anything on hemispherics, hemispheres and how it can improve your per personality thing that's published before, say 2012 or whatever, leave it there. Most of that stuff is really dodgy stuff. Hemispheres are really interesting, but we loathe to understand how they actually work in so many respects because it's fascinating. But we do know they have particular responsibilities. I'm going to give you a bit of a test. Well, actually, let me show you this first. Would you like to tell me which one of these do you think is a male brain, which one do you think is a female brain performing the same task? The left is male, the right is female. Okay. All right. Let me give you a little bit of a test for your hemispheres. This is another part of my day that I really enjoy. This is called the Stroop test. Here's what you do. As you look at the words across the screen, starting from the top, going from left to right, in your mind or quietly to yourself, don't say the word that you see, say the color. Try it. I know right about here, I want to put on some music and, you know, the <whistles> have you walk like an Egyptian. Because I see a lot of people doing this. <laughs> Green. So what's actually happening is your right hemisphere is trying to attend to the task I gave you, which is the responsibility of the right hemisphere. Left hemisphere, where language is processed, knows that Y-E-E-L-L-O-W is yellow, not green. Some of you might be able to do this quite easily. You might have really good hemispheric connectivity. Some of you are thinking, I bet you I could get better. You probably could. But the sheer amount of time and energy you'd have to expend to do so suggests that you have other issues. <laughs> By way of example, let me give you, can you fold your arms over, please, just like this? Okay, now fold those arms opposite. Uh, there's always a few. That's like... Now think about this. See, some, some stage in your life, you folded your arms over, you folded your arms over, you folded your arms. So it becomes hardwired in your brain. And then somebody says, fold them opposite, and you literally have to spend a whole lot of cognitive energy thinking, oh my gosh, what does that look and feel like? And then when you get there, it's like, I don't like this. <laughs> think of if the fact, if it's that difficult for you to change how you fold your arms, how long do you think it's going to take you to do this? Let's make it more interesting. All right, as you go across the words now, this time, do not say, so if the word does not have a box, say the color. If it has a box, say the word. Try it. The only reason I show you this is I came across this, <laughs> interestingly enough, at a university where psychologists were doing this as a drinking game. <laughs> and the, the task was, all right, you have to say it out loud. If you make a mistake, have a drink. And I tell you what, it didn't take long before those psychologists lost any notion of any hemispheric activity. <laughs> now, here's something a little bit more interesting, all right, a little bit more serious. Those two regions of the brain sit in the left hemisphere. The part of the oval is an area of the brain that's referred to as Wernick's area, named after Carl Wernick. 
Okay? The circular area is named Broca's area, Broca's region, named after Paul Broca, French neuroscientist. Long before either Carl Wernicke or Paul Broca could look at brain scans, they found out something really interesting about these particular regions of the brain. Wernicke's area is an important area that you're using right now. As I talk to you, as you hear my words, you're reading text, it allows you to comprehend language. It does many other things, your temporal lobes, your prior lobes, all, there's lots of other activity there, but that's really where much of that happens. Broca's area, on the other hand, is the part of your brain that allows you to put language together, to put your thoughts together, to put your words together, so if you want to say something or think, or think something. It's your syntax area. Right? Now, we know that Broca's area has to, or sorry, Wernicke's area has to mature before Broca's area. You have to be able to understand and comprehend language before you can articulate language. Children do not leave the womb speaking. They leave the womb babbling, making crying noises, pooping, all those things. And over time, as they learn to comprehend language, they learn to put language together. All right, makes sense to you? Now, we know the reason Wernicke and Broca found out about this is because if you suffer some measure of trauma there, it can be really problematic. People who have strokes in that region of the brain will lose language capacities. Okay, if it's in Wernicke's area, you might have difficulty understanding what people are saying. You might lose the capacity to read. Okay, you might lose capacity understanding language. If you had it in Broca's area, you might have difficulty talking. Okay, now, here's something interesting. Wernicke's area, in terms of neural maturation, seems to mature about two years sooner in girls than in boys. Okay? In other words, what we know is that the neural connectivity that occurs in those areas is about the same in a three-year-old girl as it is in a five-year-old boy. Now, that has pretty substantive implications when it comes to, thing, if you're thinking about things called literacy. Right? This is the reason why there are some countries, Finland included, that don't teach literacy to kids until they're about seven or eight years of age, because that's when it kinds of balance out. Now, this isn't the case for all kids. This is typical. Right? Some boys might have good, good language skills, but typically boys are about 18 months to two years behind girls in terms of language. What kids need when they arrive at school is good oral language skills. That's the premise of all other things that happens in school. Right? If you're taking kids at four years of age and engaging in literate practices and boys aren't ready for it, it can be really, really problematic. We've seen this in Queensland not long ago. Um, some of you might be familiar with something called the Year 2 Diagnostic Net. If you're not familiar, let me explain how it worked. Who's never heard of that? It, it, I don't think it's in practice anymore. But basically what happened, uh, kids in Year 2 were put through a series of screening uh, mechanisms over the course of the year. They weren't tests or anything, they were just screening devices, which is not bad practice. You want to ha know where kids are at in terms of literacy and numeracy. And then in September, October, evaluations were made about and kids stopped being kids, they became kind of like tuna, because teachers talk about who got caught in the net. Now, by and large, if you look statistically, uh, when this was being done, who do you think got caught in the net in terms of literacy? Yeah, by about 600%, okay? Boys. Now, that's not necessarily a problem, except for what the next part of that practice was. Next part of that practice was, if Stephen was caught in the net in year two, then when he was in year three, the school he was at got funding to support his literacy needs, and that typically meant what would happen is teachers would engage in some kind of literacy time, and teacher aid or somebody coming, Stephen, while they're doing this, you come with me. Now, what message do you think that sends to a seven or eight-year-old boy? I'm different, and, and they don't like it. So the message there is that if you're going to intervene with kids, you intervene with them collectively. You can help Stephen in a collective sense. The minute you segregate him, it sends real bad negative messages for him. Uh, and the other thing is, too, Stephen hits year four, and his literacy has come up. We did a good job. Well, he might have just been a little bit delayed. It wasn't a product of the education. It was a product of his neurodevelopment. Here's another example. I'm going to focus on males a little bit. Are you aware that about nine or ten years of age, boys start to have about five to seven surges of testosterone through their system every day? This goes on for the rest of our lives. Interestingly enough, we hit about, in our 30s, most of the surges happen from about midnight to 7 a.m. Don't know why, but maybe you have a guess. Um, as a young boy, as a young boy, when you have a surge of testosterone going through, sitting still is not an easy proposition. What testosterone says to a male body is, got to move. I got to move, and I have difficulty focusing on things. In Jenny's brain, we all have this. We have the anterior cingulate cortex, the orbital frontal cortex that's in there. For, for females, there are far more neural connections there, which means you process emotional stimuli, social stimuli, much better than I do. And in fact, when you're processing emotional stimuli in a social context, you use most of your brain. For me, it's happening predominantly here. Now think about that. 
For males, emotional processing typically happens here. And where is language? Here. And never the twain shall meet. <laughs> well, I'm serious. How many times have you said to your partner or son or whatever, so, how are you feeling? Okay. No, really, how are you feeling? Okay. <laughs> have you had situations where you ask boys to, how are you feeling and they can't articulate how they feel? Well, there's a reason for that. They can't articulate how they feel, particularly if they're stressed. Now we'll come back to Jenny. Your brain's a little bit smaller than mine, hard to tell. We have a band of tissue, we both do, called the corpus callosum. It's the only thing that connects the hemispheres of our brain. Our corpus callosum are actually the same size. So you have proportional greater connectivity for the hemispheres. The other thing you have is you have far more neural connections in your corpus callosum than I do. So your capacity to process information from right to left, left to right, back to front, front to back, is far better than mine. Now we're not talking hours here, we're talking milliseconds, okay? But if you tag that with auditory processing, which males are a little bit slower on that, there's often a neurophysiological reason why if you ask questions of kids in class, girls' hands shoot up sooner. Right? It takes boys a little bit longer to process the information. These chemicals are really interesting too. Oxytocin. Uh, do you know what oxytocin is? Oxytocin is a bonding chemical. Males have oxytocin. We have oxytocin. Fortunately, we have another chemical in our body called vasopressin, which kind of counterbalances oxytocin. And it's fortunate because one of the things oxytocin does is promotes lactation. And if you're a guy, you don't want that to happen. It's a bonding chemical. When, when women go into labor, oxytocin shoots through the roof, right? Because they have to bond with the child and they have to feed the child. Oxytocin is incredibly elevated. You can see tomorrow, maybe not tomorrow, or the next couple of days, watch the senior school. I can, you can see the girls when their oxytocin is elevated because they've got a lot of this going on. Hi, how are you? I miss you so much. Hug me, hug me, hug me. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of girls who do a lot of hugging on campus. All right? Now, you don't see that with boy behavior, and that's fine, but testosterone does something a little bit differently. In 2003, I was in Colorado Springs doing some work at the University of Colorado. I went to the local shopping mall. I like to go to the mall at times because I like to watch kids. Right? You've got to be careful when you say that because people are like, <laughs> you like... Or, you know, when you're an early childhood educator, you can say, I love children. Me, my pre I love adolescents. I say that and people, oh, you do, do you? Um, I love watching kids in their natural environment. <laughs> so I was having a cup of coffee, and in 2003, see, kids don't wear uniforms. So where do a lot of kids like to go when school ends in high school? To a mall, don't they? Have you been down to Westfield Chermside at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock of a day and see how many, how many uniforms are there? So I'm sitting having a cup of coffee, and I'm watching kids arrive. And uh, boys on that day were wearing the NBA basketball look. And they were wearing it well. Track pants, sh shoes worth more than my house. And they had thing, I don't like the word, but it works, bling. They had some bling. And the more bling you had, the more swagger went with it. So I'm having a cup of coffee, and I see these adolescent males arrive. And they're always easy to find, you know, because security's right behind them. Right. <laughs> you will never go to Chermside. I'd love to go to Chermside one day and watch security following the pensioners. Ooh, I wonder what they're up to. You don't see that. But you follow the 15-year-olds. Anyway, so I'm watching these boys, and out of nowhere, one boy from each group takes like two, three quick steps, and they lunge, and they chest each other. Now, the Canadian in me is going, oh, it's a gang thing, I'm going to die. And then I watched, they did that, and then they just kept walking. And I watched adolescent males throughout the course of the day, sometimes one, sometimes two, sometimes en masse, chesting each other. And then it occurred to me, oh my gosh, they're just saying hello. So it went from gang warfare to Discovery Channel in an instant. <coughs> <coughs> now, think about this. How many times do you see boys, in an educational context, or anywhere for that matter, announce themselves physically? What are you doing? Uh, uh, did you hit him? Keep your hands and feet to yourself. Okay. And Stephen walks another 10 meters, sees his next friend. Whack! We tend to announce ourselves physically, and we often get into trouble for it. And I'm going to give you a real good example in a minute. Okay? Cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It's very easy to measure your cortisol levels. Cortisol, if we swab your saliva, add the records of chemicals, we can tell how elevated cortisol is in your system, and that tells us how stressed or anxious you might be. So if we come back to Jenny. I'll tell you how powerful cortisol is. Let's say at the end of today, Jenny and I are having a bit of discussion. We're talking about her smaller brain and how she didn't like me talking about her smaller brain and some of the jokes I made. I wasn't really happy for her and she's not really pleased. And she thinks, you know, you probably shouldn't have said those things. By the way, I don't like your glasses and I don't think you're very attractive. And please go home. <laughs> We're a bit agitated with each other, right? A little while after that, both of us will start thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. 
maybe I shouldn't have done. Have you ever had that experience? When you've had a bit of a confrontation with somebody a little while later, you think, oh, I shouldn't have said that. How many of you have heard, you know, if you get an email that elicits an emotional response, wait 24 hours, right? And how many of you do this? Oh, really? <laughs> Feeling better. Well, here's why. When you go into a fight or flight response, cortisol elevates. Cortisol's fundamental job is to ensure your survival. And how it does this is it shuts down cognition, shuts down your thinking. And it's only when cortisol goes to normal, to homeostasis, that you have clarity of thought. So only after cortisol returns to normal can Jenny say things to herself, oh, I probably shouldn't have called Mike an old fart because he really wasn't saying that many. He was just making jokes, right? Because she starts having clarity of thought. It's one of the reasons why I love going to conferences. When I, I love it when they get up and say, right, a little bit of housekeeping. In the, I was in Launceston speaking at an early childhood conference. The guy came up, in the event of an emergency, please sit patiently and wait for the center staff member in the red helmet to direct you to where to go. Knowing what I know, I had to say what I had to say. I pretty much know that if flames come shooting out of this wall, the whole room starts to shake, you're not going to wait around for somebody in a red hat. <laughs> you're going to run like hell. You're going to sk- and probably later you'll think, ooh, I probably shouldn't have stepped on Mike on my way out. So I would appreciate that if, you, if something happens, you let me go first. Um, that's what cortisol does. Now, researchers found something out really interesting purely by accident. Typically, cortisol is much more functionally present in females than it is in males. But the kicker to this is, and this was found out with kids looking at saliva. So kids were coming home, coming to school, and as part of a stress research project, researchers were swapping their saliva, looking at cortisol elevation, then those kids that were stressed, they would talk to the kids about trying to figure out what triggered the stress response. Very simple thing. What was interesting is they found if there was a sibling pair, so if Jenny and I were brother and sister, and there was some kind of confrontation at home, it might have been we just had an argument with each other, mom or dad, nothing you know, uh, nefarious or anything, just normal sort of things that can happen at home. It takes about, Jenny, about 20 to 25 minutes for her cortisol to go to normal. For me, about an hour. Same context, same. Females will process cortisol and stress much, much quicker than males. The problem that what the researchers saw too was exacerbated in schools because boys would arrive at school and they'd sit down and they, the teacher would see that the boys, there was a, obviously they were anxious or stressed, say, Stephen, what's wrong? Tell me how you're feeling. Or, look, Stephen, I don't know what the problem is. Get your books out where you get started. So pushing the boys out of apathy or anger in an instant takes almost 45 minutes longer for me to process that stress because we don't do it well because we're... We evolved to kill things. So, oh, we're almost on time. That's good. A few more things. So I wrote a book about this, about boys. I was really interested in what was happening with boys. I was speaking at a conference once. Not a good thing. Somebody said, this is Dr. Michael Nagel. He's really interested in little boys. (laughs) I'm not a boy or girl expert. I'm interested in how kids learn. So I wrote a book on boys because I'm not convinced that, you know, in 2000 in this country, the Federal Inquiry into Boys wrote a report called Boys Getting It Right, saying boys were in trouble. Well, were they in trouble? Maybe. The reasons why I think are really interesting. Because I'm not so sure boys are the problem that we might think they are. I think it could be a question of perception. Let me give you an example. Here's some quotes. Oh, what sins have I committed? I'm chasing with teaching heavily testosterone boys last period on Friday afternoon. Of all the animals, boys are the most manageable. All boys are human, even when there's reason to suspect the contrary. Interesting. Well, first one comes out of a book published in 2001. Tim Hawks, the headmaster of King's College in Sydney. This is attributed to Plato. This was Jacques Barza in a book called We Who Teach, published in 1944. In 2000, the Federal Inquiry into Boys in the Commonwealth Government of Australia said boys were in trouble. In 1860, in the UK, there was a study looking at boys and girls and learning. Not a lot of kids were at school, but they said girls come to learn. Boys have to be driven. If in 1860 boys are a problem and 2000 they're a problem, who really are the slow learners? The question I have is, is they're the problem or is it the context? Okay, now I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to go over this very quickly. This is over a decade ago. I was invited to a school to look at their behavior management program. The behavior management program was fashioned along the lines, the philosophies of William Glasser, the American psychologist, and Ed Ford, responsible thinking. This school had six rules. These rules were posted everywhere around the school. It was a very simple process. It was a three-strike process. Stephen comes to school one day. He walks by his friend. Bang! Teacher sees him. Stephen, do you have a piece of paper? No. Okay. Strike one. Strike one. Stephen, what did you do? I hit him. What are the rules? 
keep my hands and feet to myself. What happens when you break the rules? I go to the student support classroom. Is that what you want to have happen? No. Write down, keep hands and feet to self. Stephen takes the paper. He's walking along a little bit later, sees another friend, can't resist. Boom. Stephen, do you have a piece of paper? Yes. Ah, oh, second strike. I see you've chosen to go to the thinking station. All over the school and school grounds, there was a thinking station. It was a chair somewhere. And Steve would joyfully go to the thinking station because he couldn't wait to disengage with his friends, sit down and think. And the teacher would then approach him and talk to him about what he did, how he had to modify his behavior, how hitting his friends wasn't a good idea. Strike two. Get the idea? Take the piece of paper. Lo and behold, because Stephen's impulsive, he's got testosterone surging through his body. He sees his next friend, bang, bang, bang. Stephen, do you have a piece of paper? Yes. Oh, third strike. I see you've chosen to leave. Stephen would take his piece of paper with all the rules he broke. He'd go to a place called the Student Support Classroom. It was a demountable building, brown paper on all the windows so kids couldn't see outside, soundproofed cubicles. Stephen would give that piece of paper to the teacher and or teacher aide. The teacher and or teacher aide would put all the infractions in a database and say, Stephen, whenever you're ready to write a plan to re-engage with the learning environment, you let me know. Stephen could wait an hour, a day, a week. The longest I saw a kid there was about 11 days. This amazing little boy who's kind of like a eight-year-old Sheldon Cooper. This kid was bright, but he had some issues. And I was in the class when this happened. It was fascinating because I heard all about this kid. I want to see him in action because he's really bright. So he's given this amazing discussion on frogs. And he's doing all this stuff and he's showing all this stuff. And his teacher, she should have known better. She said, look, I think he made a mistake. And he just looked at her and said, look, what the do you know about frogs? <laughs> gone. There's no strikes there. You can't swear to a teacher. You're gone. And it took him a long time because he, in his mind, he was absolutely right. Um, so the kids could write a plan, but they couldn't write it until they were calm. Right? So they'd write a plan. Now, what was interesting, from January to August, over 2,800 times, a kid walked into that room with a piece of paper. This was a school with 750 kids. 52% of the population were girls, 48% boys. Prep or preschool at that time to year seven. So they had a lot of frequent flyers. Now, if you look who was there, over almost 85% of the infractions were boys. And I wasn't there to critique what the teachers were doing. I was trying, they wanted me to understand, why is this happening? So, well, let's have a look. So we looked, and they were there. 80% of the time, the infractions had something to do with fidgeting, inappropriate movement, or aggression. Aggression. And I said to the teachers, okay, well, fine. You know, we've been trained, teachers have been trained in a particular way with behaviors to look at kids in a particular way, but let's change our lens. Okay, so here's what we know. As a young boy, Stephen, in the youngest years of his life, will have serotonin will be much more functionally present in his female classmates than in him. What that means in everyday reality is that sitting still on the carpet is not easy for him, right? So he comes in and he can't sit still and you say, stop fidgeting, stop moving. And he can't. It's almost like you should say to him, hiccup now. Right? Or it's exacerbated because he's outside doing more, he's running around doing all these things. He comes in and the teacher says, and some of you have done this, I know I have, Right, class, it's time for USSR, unsustained silent reading. Take out your books and calm down, which we all know is teacher code for my lunch hour wasn't long enough. <laughs> and you just exacerbate the problem. But you can do things to help them calm down. So serotonin, testosterone and metabolism. Every male in here, compared to females, has much higher metabolic rate phys physically and neurophysiologically. We also, because we have testosterone, we have all these things in our systems that give us license to act in a particular way. We tend to need movement, and we will move all the time, given the opportunity. We will announce ourselves physically. It doesn't mean we're aggressive. It means we're saying hello. I've got four friends that I grew up with. I know when I go back to Canada to see them next year, I'm going to come back here with bruises. Because we're going to revert to what we were when we were 16. It happens all the time. So by, what is an appropriate movement anyway, you know, if you think about it? Interestingly enough, there's some things we know. We know that movement is so very, very integral to how boys engage with the world. Okay? I'm not going to read through that. So boys are going to do some strange things. There's no question. <laughs> and their logic, or lack thereof, can be equally intriguing. Those of you thinking about children, be prepared if you have a son. But most boys get through boyhood just fine. I mean, look around you. I'm taking a wild guess here, but I'm pretty sure everyone here is okay in terms of their maleness. The problem, too, in what was missed in this school, which I think is equally interesting, in the Federal Inquiry into Boys in 2000, it said one of the things, maybe one of the reasons why boys were 
falling behind is because we spent too much time, energy on girls in the 1990s. So the Federal Inquiry into Boys allocated $33 million to schools that they contended for to help improve education outcomes for boys. Well, interesting enough in this school, this is before we called it NAPLAN, we were still doing year three, five, seven testing, which wasn't a bad thing. NAPLAN's another seminar. But over 40% of the girls were well below the average. More worryingly, because I spent time in this school, over 30% of the girls, roughly one in three, I guess, had been bullied throughout the year. Nobody saw it. You see, the girls would come in, sit down quietly, and everybody thought they were learning. They weren't, a lot of them. A lot of them were in distress, and a lot of them weren't learning very much. But the way they handled it was very different than the way Stephen might handle it. Now, if you're going to spend $33 million on boys, I think you should spend $33 million on girls as well, not assume that a one-size-fits-all model is going to work. So a few things about girls, and I'm going to round things off. Do they have a better brain? Well, there's enough research to suggest that most educational contexts are better suited for how girls engage with learning. Okay? It doesn't mean they have a better brain. It might just operate a little bit differently. Oh, I know, that's where you're focusing, isn't it? My daughter, when she was 12, she read the Twilight books. And then I made the biggest mistake of what a parent could ever make, a father, when she said to me, Dad, I want to go see the movie. And I'm thinking, hang on, I know this is about vampire. You're not going, I'll go with you. <laughs> yeah, very foolish. Uh, any males in here thinking about having kids, if you have a daughter, the last thing you ever want to do is go to a movie where it's full of pubescent, prepubescent females. It's just the worst night of your life. And then she comes out and... And I got wrapped up in the debate. She was enamored with some pasty-faced vampire named Edward. I kept thinking, saying, did you not see the wolf guy? You know, he had a complexion, he had this thing going on. <laughs> Clearly, he's so hot gland is problematic. Now, here's something you might find interesting. From about six months to roughly three years of age, uh, kids go through something we call infantile puberty, when sex hormones are incred incredibly elevated, estrogen in females and, and testosterone in boys. Then something happens in girls, and boys for that matter, but predominantly for girls, that I like to call this, the calm before the storm. I have this picture of Madeline. It's actually three pictures when she's a little girl. She's got a straw hat on. She's picking flowers. And the next one she's, and the next one she's kind of looking at her brother in a loving kind of way. And every now and then I have to remind myself in this 19-year-old opinionated young lady right now is that little person. Please come back to me. <laughs> because once puberty kicks in, some interesting things happen. Now, we talk about boys in puberty. We talk about testosterone and how it impacts them upon their behavior. Interestingly enough, test estrogen can have an impact on girls. We know in females it has an impact on these particular regions of the limbic system. When estrogen is elevated and not elevated, it impacts on memory, emotions, and certain uh, functions of certain organs. Here's the thing that's interesting. We know that when estrogen is elevated, so too are oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, and you feel pretty good. We also know when it goes down, we typically see things a little bit more irritable, perhaps, uh, a bit stressed, what researchers refer to as brain fog. There's a fascinating study in the United States that found that females actually did better on tests of mathematics when estrogen was elevated in their monthly cycle. That adds a whole new dimension to that plan. Here's the other thing. I'm going to put this up quick. I just, I'll explain it. Here's something that I think all parents and teachers should keep in mind, because I don't think we give it enough um, prominence in, in, when we think about young girls, is that we have a lot of research that tells us that when relationships are positive, right? So, in the monthly cycle for females, when estrogen is elevated, so too are those other chemicals. When relationships are positive and estrogen goes down, those other chemicals stay elevated. In other words, relationships, positive relationships, have a direct impact on the neurophysiology of females. It keeps dopamine, oxytocin, and serotonin elevated. Really, really important. Conversely, when relationships plummet, that has a hugely negative impact. Some other considerations, I get this, you know, boys use more physical space. I often get this question. I was at, speaking to the parents of Brisbane Boys Grammar, and somebody said to me, so, doc, is after asking, Dr. Neil, in your esteemed opinion, what's better, single sex or co-ed? Now in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, I'm at Brisbane Boys Grammar. Clearly, single sex is better. <laughs> now, do you know, there isn't any evidence to suggest that one or other is better for kids. It all depends on what? The kid, the kid. For some kids, single-sex schools work well. For some, they don't. 
Uh, my daughter went to an all-girls school. My son's at a co-ed state high school. That's where he needed to be. That's where she needed to be. It works really well. I'm not, I don't like to use anecdotes all the time, but we do know that the best thing for kids is what's best for the kid. Right? Um, the other thing you might find interesting, and I mentioned this to teachers, there's a big move in the United States right now and in Canada for something called gender-specific instruction, where in co-ed settings, which I think is really positive, they take kids and they separate them from particular subject areas. Right? They keep them together. So for example, you might have a year three class and uh, it's in a time in the morning when they're doing literacy things and the teacher works with the boys for a period of time, then works with the girls and then brings them together, covering the same content in very different ways. Okay? Too much to talk about here, but again, you can Google gender specific instruction and you can find all kinds of lessons and stuff about how to do that. All right, now I want to go back here. We're in the home stretch, talk about technology, then we'll open for questions. So I want to talk a little bit about technology. All right, let's, let's do a bit of a straw poll here. How many baby boomers in here? Everybody else look at the higher order species. <laughs> Gen X, yep, you're okay too. Gen Y, yeah. Look at them in scorn. They're very different. Gen Y, you're the first generation to grow up in a digital age. You've known nothing else other than digitization. I tell my kids how I used to have to watch television. <laughs> Fortunately, growing up in the prairies of Canada, when I was a kid, we had three channels at the time before we got the American channels. We had uh, CTV, CBC, and CBC French, which no one ever really watched unless it was a Friday night because it was kind of like SBS. Um, <laughs> because the French do things a little bit differently. You were raised to expect success. There's a fascinating research that tells us that Y Jenner's been raised to expect success even if they don't deserve it. Even if they don't deserve it. Uh, you see the world you're ambivalent towards authority. In the 1980s, in most Western countries, uh, Canada, Australia, schools, education systems said, you know what? We can't hit kids anymore. No more corporal punishment. We're not going to do that anymore. Then we coupled that with a view that their opinions mattered. <laughs> when I was in high school, kids, teachers would say, Mike, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. <laughs> so you tend to be a little bit ambivalent towards authority. I, what were we thinking? We're not going to hit them, and we're going to give them an opinion. Mix for complete disaster. So, but you have been using technology in ways that we can only dream of. And most people forget or we, because it's, it's so normalized, we forget how new it is, right? If you think about it, Mark Zuckerberg is celebrating his 10th anniversary with Facebook. 10 years, that's it. The devices many of you hold right now, 15 years ago, if you had a flip phone, that was high tech, right? I had a flip phone. My daughter, she was embarrassed. I wanted to keep that as long as I, she didn't get it. You know, I'd pull up my flip phone and say, oh, put it away, Dad. Nobody has those anymore. In my mind, what am I doing? Boop, boop, boop. This is like Captain Kirk. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to be talking to Scotty. <laughs> Can't do it, Captain. So here's some things we're finding about technology that's problematic. One of the biggest things we're seeing with all ages, but particularly with young people, is overuse. How many of you, first thing you do when you get in the morning is check your device? How many of you have your device? Oh, you don't have to answer, but it's okay. I'll get some. <laughs> How many of you, these are rhetorical, how many of you have your devices nearby all throughout the night? Now, I suspect if we did a straw poll, you would find that the older we are, the less likely that is to occur. Okay? But it is overuse, and it's happening with kids. So here's some potential overuse. Checking email, texting. Show of hands, how many of you check your email regularly? Fairly regularly. Uh, text, do a lot of texting. Uh, web surfing, checking things. Online gambling, online gaming, <laughs> online pornography. Just checking, you never know. The other thing that we're seeing in conjunction with that are addictive behaviors. The diagnostic manual that psychologists and psychiatrists, psychiatrists use now has identified internet addiction as a, a, as a diagnosable disorder. It's a diagnosable disorder. And people who have internet addiction, when they're weaned off of it, go through the same withdrawal symptoms as people who are on heroin. The same sort of withdrawal. Okay? We're seeing this increasing with kids. Okay? Now, it's really easy to reinforce dependency We've seen this with um, animal experiments. Behavior has known this for years. So if you take an animal like Scrat and you put food out at the exact same time every day, Scrat will learn to come to that food. 
right? Gets excited. He knows. Doesn't need a watch. He knows. Then he can change the, the, dam, uh, the parameters. He can put a light on, and Scrat will learn to come when the light's on. But we use technology in a way that it becomes like this. If you don't do it in a pattern, if it's random, you're checking it all the time. And kids are doing this all the time. They're checking their stuff all the time. And the other thing about it is it gives you a bit of a high. You see, games and stuff on those devices elevates dopamine. How many of you play Candy Crush? Some of you, you know, I do. I always like when I say, oh, Jenny, you do. Hello, Jenny. <laughs> what level are you at? I haven't played before. That's okay. What level are you at? <laughs> I see you went to the Donald Trump School of Answering. What <laughs> level are you at? One of the things about, I don't know if you realize that, but a lot of the games that people use, uh, kids and adults like, uh, they're designed with um, uh, gambling research. See, they're designed to entice you in and keep you going and keep you playing. And they do so by elevating your dopamine. They elevate your dopamine by giving you bells and whistles and rewards every time, and you want to keep playing. And then they give you, it's free, but then they have in-app purchases, right? So you get to a particular level, and you want to keep going, and you can't unless you spend 99 cents. And so you spend 99 cents, and it gets you to the next, and then you can't. And then you get your credit card bill in a month, and it's $350 later. You're on level whatever that you can't remember. And there's differences. We still know, to, to date, um, girls are typically using uh, technology for social media, boys for gaming, by and large. Okay. Now, there's some strategy bouts. I'll just put a couple things up here. I'm not going to go through this, because I'll just leave this to you to read, because we're running short on time. I just want to alert you to a couple of things. Um, I see the prime minister has decided he, they're going to, and the minister are going to change funding for schools, and that's contestable about what that might look like. But I thought what was interesting in his part of his um, rhetoric was we have to change the funding so that we can um, ensure that the students are maintaining international standards. We're going to, we're going to climb up the PISA rankings because PISA is so very important. You know, we're, we're currently at 14th, but it gives politicians a good spin. But the funny thing is, politicians typically cherry pick research, you know? So they talk about PISA like it's the panacea for identifying achievement, when in fact, any measure of standardized testing is flawed right from the get-go. But again, that's another seminar. We can come back, I can come back and talk about NAP plan and Senate, but we won't do that. But what's interesting is, if the OECD is so important and they have all these things, maybe we should look at everything they talk about, right? So in 2015, they published a report called Technology and Schools. And the head of the OECD said that in quotes. And you can see it in the report. You can get this report online, 250 pages, OECD, Computers and Schools. For all intents and purposes, technology was not enhancing any outcomes. It was probably pushing outcomes backwards. Right? And the countries that use it the least are always in the top of the PISA rankings. So those countries there, South Korea, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Japan, and Poland, use computers in school and at home for schoolwork less than any other country. And look who uses it the most. Now, the interesting thing about this report, too, was they were so quick to say, look, while Australia uses it more, they probably use it a little bit better. So just because they use it a lot is not indicated. But what they said, the best thing about this report is that across all measures, of outcome, technology is not helping kids. And probably we should spend too much time and energy. And the fundamental reason, there are two reasons why. One is we don't know how to use it well. And two, most of the things that are used for learning are not built on any measure of learning science principles. And how technology is used is highly problematic. Again, you don't have to believe me. You can get this report. You can go home tonight. You can download it and have a read. It makes for interesting reading. I'm not anti-technology, but I think anything we do to and with children should be based on the best available evidence. And it's a tool, not an outcome. Yes, I'm vehemently opposed to any measure of technology and encoding to kids under the age of eight. I haven't seen any evidence that says it's going to do them any good. And we also know that's an increasing contributor to sedentary behavior. As someone who studies child development, I'm very much concerned with the fact that kids today are sitting longer than any other generation. And that's highly problematic for all avenues of development. And importantly, this comes up over and over and over again, physical activity. I'm going to tell you why physical activity is important, because 
when you move, when you go out walking, when you do things, you release a very powerful uh, chemical in your brain called brain-derived neutrophic factor, okay? And it works like this. It's kind of like miracle growth for the brain. When this is released, it enhances the health of your brain and dendrite growth. It enhances cognition. And it happens when you engage in physical activity. Because when you do that, the brain says, oh, hang on, this is a little bit stressful because you're engaging physical activity, whether it be even going for a walk. We need to release this chemical because it helps us. It happens through the cerebellum. And it acts as miracle growth for the brain. So having kids engage with technology for longer periods of time takes them away from the very things that actually enhances their development. And I'll leave you with one other thought. I've talked a lot. You've been really good. You haven't fallen asleep yet. That's good. You've been a good sport, Jenny. I hope you don't hate me. But you do have a smaller brain. Um, <laughs> what's really important is, is this. We have, with all the research we have, the stuff that keeps coming through over and over and over again is the fact that probably the most important thing for kids <laughs> is positive relationships. The evidence tells us the most important thing in child's development and academic success are relationships they have with their parents and teachers. And the very fact that you would take two hours out of your time to sit here and listen to me suggests you probably already know that, but I will thank you for your time. <laughs>